Welcome, and thank you for joining me, Ms. Trot, once again for Math and Science for Young Children. In each of our sessions, we will be reviewing math, science, and early childhood topics. Our goals for this session include apply mathematical concepts of sorting to a variety of real life experiences, apply scientific inquiry processes to exploration of sink and float activities, and understand the engage, explore, reflect learning cycle format of the exemplar activities guide. Make sure you download the note sheet to go along with this video and stick around as we learn all about math and science for young children. Our math topic for this session is sets, using attributes to make collections. There are a few different words that we need to know about when we're talking about sets. The first is a set. A set is any collection that is grouped together in some meaningful way. Some examples of a set might be dogs, toys, or colored beads. An attribute is the characteristic or property used to describe an object. Attributes can be used to sort collections into sets. For example, if we have the collection of beads, we might break those into attributes of small or red or shiny, plastic, a way that we can take that um, collection and we can separate it based on an attribute. When we teach about sets, there are three big ideas we need to remember. The first is that attributes can be used to sort collections into sets. So again, the color, the size, shape, type of object, something like that. The second big idea for sets is the same collection can be sorted in different ways. So if I had a group of sorting bears and the bears were different colors and they were different sizes, I could sort these bears by either size or color. A set can be compared and ordered. So they can be compared by which is there more, more red bears or more blue bears. And then they can be ordered, such as going from small, medium, and to large. When you are teaching children about sorting, it's important to remember to make sorting playful. Children like fun. Incorporating sorting into everyday routines, such as how materials are organized in the classroom, cleanup time, and snack time are also sorting activities. Comment on children's spontaneous sorting. For example, I see you put all the red beads on your necklace and you use all the cylinder shaped blocks in your tower. This really brings home those ideas that sorting is a natural thing that children do during play. Recognize that over time, children's abilities to think flexibly about attributes will also grow. I've explained that we're going to be doing hands-on science activities each week, and we call these exemplar activities. Each exemplar activity has a guide that is designed to be an introduction to a science topic for young children. Each guide contains a list of materials, easy to follow step-by-step -step instructions for setting up and facilitating the activity, suggested questions to ask the children, helpful tips, and background information for the teacher's own science content knowledge. Yeah, these are also broken up into three different categories, the engage, explore, and reflect cycle. So in the engage section, the teacher is going to introduce objects, events or questions to engage the students, access learners' prior knowledge, and respond to learners' interests. The learners will be perceiving and recognizing something of interest in the environment and demonstrating curiosity. In the explore section, the teacher is going to create the environment, support enhancing learners' interests and curiosities link the new information to the learner's prior knowledge and previous experiences, and take note of what the learner is most interested in to expand upon and provide further discussion and new exploration. At the same time, the students are going to be actively exploring objects and phenomena, connecting to prior knowledge and experiences, collecting further information using science and mathematic processes, and building concept development and personal understanding. The next part of the cycle is to reflect. In this area, teachers will facilitate science talks to help learners refine ideas, communicate, construct explanations, and draw conclusions. They're gonna model and support using scientific language, ask more focused questions, 
help learners make those connections, and help learners plan further investigations. And at the same time, the students will be able to talk about what they did during explorations, compare their own thinking with that of others, express their observations, ideas, and understanding in a variety of ways, such as talking, drawing, journals, and creative play, practice using scientific language, and apply learning to new situations. In this week's exemplar activity, you are going to be focusing on physical science with the concepts sink and float. Children make predictions about whether various objects will sink or float and then test the objects by placing them in a tub of water. They sort and classify the objects into floaters and sinkers. As they experiment, the children make observations about the properties of the different objects and construct explorations about what factors determine if an object sinks or floats. The underlying science concepts for this exemplar activity are that some objects float in water and some objects sink, different properties of an object, such as the material it's made of, shape, size, and weight affect whether it will sink or float. Be sure to take a look at the Engage, Explore, and Reflect sections of your exemplary activity guide. As you reflect, think about what did you learn about sinking and floating? Do you have any new ideas about why some things float and some things sink? and complete at least one of the activities in the ideas for further exploration. Let's take a look at this video to help us demonstrate the principles behind sinking and floating. Why do things float? It depends upon two things, weight, how heavy something is, and volume, how much space it takes up. To understand why things float, it helps to understand why things sink. First, let's put a bowling ball in a bucket of water. Let's pause. The bowling ball and the water can't be in the same place at the same time. The water has to move out of the way to make room for the bowling ball. This is called displacement. It means being pushed out of place. So, as the ball goes down, it pushes the water up. Once the ball is completely underwater, it has all the space it needs. Then the water stops moving up. The volume of the displaced water is the same as the volume of the ball. But volume is not what makes the ball sink. The ball sinks because it's heavy. This bowling ball weighs 12 pounds. Water weighs something, too. A bowling ball-sized chunk of water weighs about 10 pounds. The water wants to return to its original level, but there's a 12-pound bowling ball in the way. Since the bowling ball is heavier than the displaced water, the bowling ball has more sinking power. Now, what if we replace the bowling ball with something lighter, like a balloon? This balloon is the same size or volume as the bowling ball, but it weighs much less. Now we have 10 pounds of water pushing down on a very light balloon. The water is heavier than the balloon, so the water sinks, forcing the balloon up. Now the balloon is floating on top. Or is it? The balloon doesn't weigh much, but it does weigh something. If you look closely, you'll see it's displaced just a little water. The water it displaced weighs the same as the balloon. Boats work the same way. Boats are heavy, but they are also very large and a lot of that space is just air. Because boats are so large, they displace an enormous volume of water. All that water is heavy. The boat can't push down more than its own weight, so the weight of the water keeps it afloat. So, to recap, an object floats if the water it displaces weighs as much as the object. If the object weighs more than the displaced water, then the object sinks. Remember, this information is for you, the teacher, the facilitator of the science activity, to build your own background knowledge. Just in reviewing that video, while an object's weight does play a role in why some things float and others sink, it's not the only factor. An object's density, the relationship between its volume and mass, is a key factor. Therefore, the mass and volume of an object both affect whether it will sink or float, and changes to either of these variables might change the result of the sink-float test. Density explains why a ping-pong ball floats and a large marble of its equal size sinks. Thanks for tuning in for this session. I hope that you guys go onto your course and find out all of the other information that is there posted for you, as well as do the experiments and activities. If you have any questions, please reach out to me, Ms. Trot, or your instructor. We are here to help you. 
and we'll see you next time as we learn more about math and science for young children.